All right, welcome everyone to our new members mixer 2018. This is our second annual uh, new members mixer that um, we've had um, in the fall of the year. And this is Una Daly from the Community College Consortium for OER. And we're so glad that all of you could make it today. If you haven't had a chance, you might want to introduce yourself in the chat window. Um, this meeting um, is really an opportunity for us to uh, meet our new members um, and have them share a little bit with us. And then we're going to have a um, we're going to have a little discussion about how to be a change leader at your college, which I think probably many of you um, are already being that. Uh, but we have two wonderful speakers who are going to share with us how that works at their college. And that's uh, Cindy DeMica from um, Nicolette College in Wisconsin and Michael Mills from Montgomery College in Maryland. And then about seven of you sent us um, questions uh, that you wanted uh, answered. And so my um, uh, entire executive council, uh, which are amazing leaders at their own institutions, um, are here to help answer those. Um, but we also have a lot of other members online who've got great experience and we're going to encourage them to answer uh, the questions that you posted for us. Okay, right. can everyone hear me uh, before we jump right in? All right, great. All right, so I do want to uh, mention my amazing executive uh, council staff here, or <laughs> st volunteers who do all the amazing things here at CCCOER with myself and Liz Yada, who is uh, our CCCOER specialist. I think you can see her picture there in that corner. So of course, first up is Quill West, the president of CCCOER Executive Council. She's also the OER project manager at Pierce College District in Washington, DC. We also have longtime executive council member Cynthia Alexander, who's a faculty member uh, and also uh, does distance ed coordination at Cerritos College in California. We've got Kiri Dolly. She's the digital librarian at Lord Fairfax Community College. She also is the VP of our website and blogs. So if you've done those, you've, you've uh, interacted with Kiri. And Regina Gong is the OER project manager, library manager of technical services and systems at Lansing Community College. She's also the VP of professional development um, for CCC OER, which she uh, works with Matthew Bloom uh, on as well. So they're kind of co-VPs on that this year. And Matthew is English faculty and also faculty in residence uh, for OER coordination at the Maricopa Community Colleges. He teaches at Scottsdale. And uh, also Dr. Michael Mills is, um, he is the CCCOER Partnership VP. He's also the Vice President at, for the Office of E-Learning Innovation and Teaching Excellence at Montgomery College, Maryland. And Nikki Stubbs, I hope is with us as well today. She said she might be a few minutes late. She's the Educational Technology Coordinator at the Technical College System of Georgia. And she also works with us on a number of initiatives um, for CCCOER. Did I miss anyone? Next up, I, I just really want to quickly cover a few of our uh, advisory emeritus. These are folks who've worked with us for such a long time, um, were, have been leaders in CCCOER and of course leaders at their institution. Uh, first would be James Clapa Grosskleg, who is Dean of Ed Tech and Learning Resources at College of the Canyons. Uh, um, has held many positions of leadership in CCCOER and our parent organization. Barbara Alowski, ah, we didn't update her, um, we didn't update that PowerPoint. Um, uh, Barbara is uh, currently uh, working with the Michelson Foundation on a number of um, amazing OER initiatives in California. Uh, she's had many leadership positions within California and also CCCOER. Um, and then we have Lisa Young, um, who's on sabbatical, so probably isn't joining us today, but she's the faculty director for the Center of Teaching and Learning at Scottsdale Community College, um, led the Maricopa College, uh, sorry, Maricopa Millions uh, project for many um, years and has been uh, an executive council member of ours for many years. And finally is Preston Davis from Northern Virginia Community College, who participated on our executive council for many years. He's the director of the Extended Learning Institute at Northern Virginia. So 
<laughs> wow. Um, anyway, so amazing folks, and I and some of them are here with us today. Thank thank goodness. Now I want to give an opportunity to our new members uh, to introduce themselves, um, and I hope that they'll turn on their microphones if they can. Um, so I'm going to start work first with Roxbury Community College uh, in Massachusetts, and Bill Hogue, their library director, and I have, have had a chance to meet and hear about the great programs. And, Ted, uh, who is the head of library access services, um, is joining us today to talk about the work at Roxbury. Ted? Yes, good, ap good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ted. I'm a librarian. Uh, the OER program uh, has been launched in RCC around at least two years so far and very successful. Uh, most of our faculty member from STEM programs join and use OER program a lot. And particularly in biology and statistics and math. And, and the class is, uh, they call college experience class, is kind of orientation class. The, we use OER textbooks, but we customize uh, we create our own textbooks and we select some kind of material from OER and then customize appropriate set for our uh, college. And also our library created the, the kind of lib guide, kind of platform to help a uh, faculty member kind of consult to apply the applications and write out uh, proposals. That is I want to share with you. Thank you, Ted. And um, if if you if your LibGuide is public and you'd like to share that with us, you could put that in the chat window so that people could see what your LibGuide looks like. Um, I know we have a number of folks on um, the meeting today who have very extensive LibGuides as well, and maybe um, some of them would like to share theirs um, as well, because on my executive council, of course, I have um, multiple librarians. Um, and so it might be fun to share those LibGuides uh, in the chat window. Thank you, Ted. Um, sure. Yeah, and that sounds like it sounds like great work that you're doing, and I know you guys are looking to expand that in, in, um, in the future, um, and we hope that we can support you on that work. Thank you. All right. Oh, and thanks, Regina, for putting your LibGuide in. Uh, Regina Gong from Lansing has a, a very extensive LibGuide. Um, next up is Fox Valley um, Technical College in Wisconsin, and um, Jane Ro Ro Rosum, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, Jane. Uh, who's yes, Rosum. Rosum, wonderful, who is the library manager there. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing there, Jane. Um, we've been um, using OER about three semesters now. We're using it in four different classes in the general ed department, and it's been pretty successful. The students like it. Um, we've also been um, working with other colleges in UW system, um, and you'll be talking with Cindy later, but uh, we started COW, which is a community for Open Wisconsin. So we're hoping to get that moving and make some progress here in Wisconsin with OER. Great. Well, we're really excited to have you join us, uh, Jane. And um, you're one of three colleges at, um, in um, Wisconsin, as you mentioned, Cindy, who's at Nicolette, and also um, um, Lakeshore Technical College is a member. Mm -hmm. um, and I had the opportunity to hear a little bit about Cal at uh, the Open Ed Conference in October. Yes, I was there. <laughs> Fun. Great. So I hope you'll yeah. I hope you'll share more information on the email list with us as things progress. Sure. Wonderful. All right. Next up is um, Sam, uh, who's, and let me just, I'm sorry, I've got to fix my slides here. Sam Gelling from uh, Windward uh, Community College at the, at the University of Hawaii. They have a um, an integrated system. Um, and I'm not sure if Sam was able to join us today, but she is an Apple sorry, animal science assistant professor, um, which I believe is veterinary science. Um, Sam, are you with us today? Uh, we didn't have a response from Sam, and I have a feeling she's in the middle of um, giving finals um, since she teaches. Um, we actually have the, um, all of the community colleges in Hawaii, there are seven, uh, 
seven main colleges, probably a few with extension campuses, um, joined us recently uh, within the last year and a half. And so we're really excited to also have Windward College um, join us. All right, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna uh, <laughs> round robin this. Next, I'm gonna go to a Grayson College in Texas. And I hope we have Todd Ellis with us today, who's the Director of Teaching and Learning there and is trying to get OER um, moving on his campus. Todd? Yeah, I'm here. Great. And uh, you want me to talk about just what we're doing a little bit? Sure, please. Okay. Well, we're a community college in North Texas of uh, 4,000 students. Uh, right now we have open textbooks on 15 courses and about 10 teachers who understand something along the lines of what we would call an open educational practice and are using those. Um, we also have an OER campus-wide committee, including our vice president of instruction on that committee, so that's a really good uh, tool for us and strategy. Um, currently, I've enabled OER images on Canvas dashboards, so any class that ha we haven't had any images on our LMS Canvas dashboards. So now the first ones are going to be OER, Grayson branded images to strategize, uh, strategize so students start being aware that th these are classes with OERs and to start getting them excited about it. And we also have, the more I look into OERs, the more I realize that the lib guides we have at our library are really fantastic. So <laughs> that's it. Great, great. And I, I agree that creating awareness uh, for your students is gonna be really key. Um, and, um, that's really going to help students to find out about those classes. And um, I think you and I talked about, you know, also ways to recognize the faculty um, who are doing that work and kind of, right. you know, their presence and, and thanking them. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So great. Wonderful. Thanks, Todd. Um, and now our next person, um, and I'm not sure if uh, Rebel is here with us, uh, from Florida Virtual Campus. She's the Director of Digital Services and OER. Now, Florida Virtual Campus has been a member of ours since really the beginning of CCC OER, but um, the longtime uh, representative, uh, Robin Donaldson, retired, and we've continued to work with the instructional designer, Tom, too. But I really wanted to welcome Rebel, who has taken over some of those um, duties that Robin had um, when she was at Florida Virtual Campus. Rebel, are you with us today? I, I'm afraid, well, we'll if she comes in later on today, um, we will definitely let her say hello to everyone. Uh, Florida has got a lot of uh, great OER work. They were one of the early pioneers with, um, with Orange Grove, their big OER repository, and they continue to um, you know, generate a lot of wonderful uh, OER research, which uh, many of you have probably heard before. Um, we've we've uh, hosted them at our webinars uh, to talk about textbook affordability. So really have been longtime leaders and, and continue to innovate. All right, so uh, next is Trident uh, Technical College from uh, South Carolina. And I'm not sure if David is able to join us today. David, are you online? Uh, Trident Technical is actually our first um, college um, in South Carolina. So we're really excited. We haven't had a chance to touch base with David yet. Just joined us uh, late last month and we're still scheduling a phone call with him. But um, we're really excited to have them and hopefully we'll hear from them at an, another meeting soon. All right, next up is Lori Beth Larson, um, who is English faculty at Central Lakes uh, Community College. And um, you know, we've had the opportunity to work with folks in Minnesota uh, for a while now. Uh, we used to work with Minskew, uh, which I believe has been renamed. And of course, we had Karen P Pakula, who presented with us last year, last fall, on uh, her, the learning communities that were focused on OER and also on um, some of the Z degrees. So Lori, we'd love to have an update from you on what's happening there at Central Lakes. Sure. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. All right. We have about um, 25, I think, OER courses um, 
I think there's some more. Karen Pakula is now working at Minsku, so I'm the OER lead on our campus. And we're changing into more of a mentor partnership type model for creating OER resources. So we continue with that work. Um, we're just in the middle of finishing up the um, the reports for uh, one of our innovative grants that has started the work. Um, but I'm also hoping to uh, create a budget this year and see if we can get some campus resources for sustainability and see if we can't move it more local. So. Yeah, wonderful. Well, 25 courses is a great start. And, I, you know, I hope you'll keep us posted. Um, maybe want to share uh, work at Central Lakes with us and, and throughout Minnesota, because I know there's a lot of great work going on in Minnesota. There is. Yeah, Karen has done an amazing job and Kim oversees a lot of it. So we're just, I'm just following up on her work, kind of, kind of catching up. She did a lot of work. Well, great, great. Well, thanks for joining us, Lori, and filling us in. So we Look forward to continuing to work with you. Thank you. Nice to be here. All right. And last but not least is Richard Sebastian, who is the director of the OER Degree Initiative at the Achieving the Dream. And as you know, we've worked with Achieving the Dream for um, two and a half, almost three years now on that really amazing OER Degree Initiative program. Um, Richard will tell us a little bit about that, but very quickly, 38 colleges in 13 states all developing um, at least one OER degree and some really amazing research being done uh, with this project, um, which a final report will be out in the fall of 2019. But even uh, so far, we've had two reports out that have been really very helpful on, uh, for colleges who are looking at developing OER degrees. So welcome, Richard. Hi, right, thank you. Thanks, Una. Appreciate it. And uh, yeah, so um, long time coming. Uh, we're, we're not a community college. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization here at Achieving the Dream. That, um, If you're not familiar with our organization, we work um, pretty much exclusively with community colleges. It's a membership network where we help colleges uh, uh, basically kind of holistically transform so that they kind of uh, help students, uh, more students, um, reach their uh, educational uh, outcomes, um, and so OER is uh, is a really a, a kind of a has been a uh, perfect uh, kind of tool for for us that that we recognize as as something that can really help colleges um, uh, move the needle on uh, student persistence and outcomes and um, uh, community outcomes. Uh, so we're really excited to be a uh, part of uh, the community uh, college consortium. Uh, the uh, Open Ed Consortium, and um, uh, yeah, look forward to uh, being more more deeply involved in kind of the the day to day work of the of the group. Great, thank you, Richard. And um, you know, the, I I think that's all of our new members. And um, if if we missed you, uh, please you know speak up. Um, I think we got everyone. Um, it's very exciting to have so many new members. Um, this fall, um, but we we also want to <laughs> acknowledge the amazing members that we have, our existing members, and um, we've got some really stellar people here on the phone on the phone right now. Love to give them a chance to say something, but unfortunately, because we have um, we have some other great information to share with you, we we won't have a time to do introductions from everybody. But um, really, everybody on this call is a star in OER and. Thank you for being with us. And you'll have an opportunity later on to share your experience, but um, I'll let Matthew tell you about that one. So at this point, um, I'm gonna turn this over to uh, Kiri Dolly, who's just gonna give you some, uh, some input about some things that are happening out in the field that maybe you haven't heard about or um, you might wanna share with folks back at your college. Kiri? Thank you, Una. So um, as I said, I'm gonna share some perspectives for we are Kiri, it's a little hard to understand you. Do you think you maybe you can get a little closer to your mic or turn up your mic? Is this better? That's perfect. Okay. Um, so the first uh, news item is that Clark has collected information from its uh, member libraries around the world on OER investments and cost savings. And they've determined that the use of OER has saved students, parents, schools, and governments at least $1 billion. 
Uh, the CCC OER has recently published its new member toolkit to provide our members new and old with information about CCC OER, benefits of membership, um, how members can become more involved with CCC OER. So if you haven't seen this yet, be sure to check it out. An OER guide for librarians has recently been published by Pacific University Libraries. A report from the first independent audit on OER savings conducted in North Carolina, sorry, North Dakota, was recently published and found that students there have saved at least $1 million in textbook costs. And a study recently published by American University found that students at private universities are similarly impacted by textbook costs as students at less pricey public institutions. And David Rose, one of the authors of the study, also presented on these findings at last Wednesday's CCC OER webinar on the impact of OER adoption on cost outcomes and stakeholder perception. Um, as well as CCC OER Exec Executive Council member Regina Gong also presented her own research on the impact of open textbook adoptions and high enrollment intro courses at Lansing Community College. Um, so I will put all of these links into the chat chat box so you can um, better get to these stories. All right, Th thank you so much, Kiri. Does anyone have any questions for Kiri before we continue? Wonderful. Well, it's been quite a quite a quite a uh, semester for OER. There's been a lot of great developments, and I really appreciate Kiri um, sharing that. All right. Um, now I'm going to um, turn this over to James Glapa Grossclag to tell us about the Open Education Leadership Summit last week. Sure. Thanks, Una. Hey, 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 everybody. So glad to be here, and I'm glad to see Ann Fiedler and Richard Sebastian on the on the call as well, because they were both uh, active participants in the Open Education Leadership Summit uh, last week, which uh, took place in uh, beautiful Paris. Uh, it was a fabulous event organized by our parent organization, the Open Education Consortium. As you can see on the screen, uh, 200 leaders in open education from 55 countries around the world took, play, took part in this event. It was really cool to see so much uh, uh, representation really from around the world. That was pretty, pretty stunning. Uh, some of us are lucky enough to know that, yes, op open is a global movement, uh, but boy, you could really feel it there. The event was organized again by our parent organization, the Open Education Consortium, along with the uh, International Council for Open and Distance Education, or ICDE, which uh, is a membership-based organization uh, focusing really on distance learning around the globe as well as the French government, the French Ministry of Higher Education uh, Research and Innovation. Uh, so it was quite a different event than many of us or the, than I'm used to. Uh, it was not a traditional conference format. It was rather an opportunity for, for people to work in teams. Well, first work individually, then work in teams to uh, sketch out roadmaps for uh, their own projects, perhaps, or regional projects, institutional projects. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be in a group that Richard led, uh, talking about uh, uh, open education trainers uh, and sketching out what that what that might look like. Um, and, and overall, I would say please keep your eyes open for uh, future projects that will emerge around the world from uh, this event. I think there are a lot of opportunities for collaboration beyond boundaries there. We had, again, so many people from, from, from so many different places there uh, that there should be more opportunities that uh, will emerge, perhaps sponsored by the uh, OEC, perhaps by ICDE. Uh, but while uh, Anne and Richard are here, I wonder if they'd like to add anything or share their impressions as well. Uh, I can jump in uh, and then let, let Anne go. Um, yeah, thanks, James. I, I just thought it was a really great event. Um, and I agree that um, I suppose when, when, I, when I attended, I was, I was wondering what I would uh, get out of it. Just, you know, it, Achieving the Dream works in North America and we work with community colleges. And so the global perspective was, um, uh, I, I wasn't quite sure. Um, what the benefit would be, but but it was really productive and, and it really um, I think there's a lot of kind of common kind of shared um, interests and shared uh, uh, 
um, I guess, issues um, that, that may differ to some degree, depending on kind of what area of the world you are in, but, but there's enough commonality there that I think um, it really shows that this is a, a lot of what we do kind of in a hyper local context is really can be, can be relevant to, to um, uh, institutions around the world and vice versa. There's a, a lot that we can learn from what's happening in, in other countries. So it was, a, it was a great opportunity. I'm glad that I got to go. Great. Yeah, it was great to see you there. Anne, Anne anything to, to add? Uh, sure. Hi, this is Anne. Um, it was um, it was really a great conference. I love the global perspective. Um, for us, you know, we're obviously in North America, but it was an opportunity for us to make some plans with our Canadian cousins and do some collaboration there. Um, there's a lot of talk about um, collaborating uh, through the Rebus Foundation. We got to talk to Hugh and Lena Patterson about. Um, you know, getting people here and people there to do some collaboration. And I think that conversation sort of started to happen before, but had we not been face to face, it would not have progressed as much as it did. Um, also really appreciated that roadmap format. <laughs> it was an opportunity to really sort of sit down and like I was speaking earlier with Richard and he was commenting, sit down with your colleagues and really just sort of think it through in a way that you don't otherwise get that kind of time. So it's a great time. Great to see you both. Yeah, great. Thank you, Anne. And the, the only thing I, I, I would, final thing I would add is, gosh, we in the community colleges are doing, doing great work. You know, uh, there is so much, I think, as Richard said, this hyper local work that we do often, often with, by our bootstraps or you know, on a volunteer basis, and that many of us have been doing for years. And we have got a lot of great, great projects and a lot of great adoptions and, and we're making real concrete impact on our students building z degrees um and, and you don't necessarily i don't necessarily see that many other places in the world a lot of other places in the world uh open initiatives might come out of a, a national research center or might come out of a an open university that's funded by the government or might come out of the ministry of education uh, but the the individual local work that all of you are doing is really stunning so with that i'll, I'll say thank you thank you for the opportunity to share <laughs> thank you james uh, and um and ann and richard for uh sharing your experiences um wish i could have joined you maybe next year <laughs> <laughs> all right next up i'm going to turn this over to regina gong who just uh, put something very interesting in the uh chat window here uh regina can to tell us about open ed week and the open ed conference yeah, so good afternoon, everyone. Nice to see you today. Um, I'm just going to remind all of you about our Open Education Week, which is coming up on March 4 to 8, 2019. Um, CCCOER and um, our members usually put up um, some type of um, activity, professional development that would um, commemorate Open Ed Week. So um, watch out for that. There's actually a link um, where you can put in the projects or the activities that you have slated for um, Open Ed Week. Um, and next. Okay, so the 16th annual Open Ed Conference. It's hard to imagine another uh, Open Ed Conference when it's just, you know, just pass right so um it's it's going to be in phoenix arizona from um, october 30 to november 1st um next year and i am again part of the um program committee so we are going to decide on the keynote speakers um soon and the call for proposals is um coming up so watch out for that Thank you, Regina. So, Do you have a theme for that? Is there a theme for that conference? Um, no, not yet. <laughs> we haven't discussed that yet. So, <laughs> yeah. So that is the um, website. So you can see very Aries, Arizona with the yeah. So hope to see you most of you there. Although it's gonna be over Halloween. I don't know. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, that's all. Thank you. Thanks so much, Regina. Um, and re yeah, 
and we'll we'll hear more about that um, as as things evolve next year and hope that many of you can make that. All right. Now I want to turn this over to Quill West, our president, who, um, who has been thinking about change leadership and is going to share with us some, some of her thoughts. Oh. <laughs> I'm always happy to share my thoughts. Hi, everybody. Um, let me see what happens if I try to turn. I, I've noticed that some microphones have been a bit off. So if I start to stutter, it's because of the room I'm in. Um, so just let me know if I should turn on my video. Um, so I am, um, I have been thinking about this concept of being a change manager um, because of some of the work that we've all done and the idea that OER ha does significant change at our institutions. And um, so hopefully you all got the writing that we sent around that was me trying to kind of sum up some of my favorite um, articles on being a change manager. And I um, really wanted to kind of answer and ask and answer some questions and see if we can have some people who are leading change at their institutions talk to us today about what it means, what change means and what managing change means for them. Um, and here, this is kind of my list of questions that I'm perpetually trying to answer. <laughs> um, so I'm going to post the link, but I think actually let's let our speakers talk and then we can come back if we need to come back to some of these questions. Um, but really, as as we're having bigger conversations about what it means to be an open education leader, we should be really thinking about what does it mean to sustain good positive change at our institutions. Um, and because it's not enough to be a change agent if you can't sustain that change is really where I want to come at this from. So um, without taking up any more time, I would like to introduce our first speaker today. Um, so Cindy, if you're ready, we're, um, we're going to get to hear from Cindy DeMica on her work. And she's got one of the best titles ever, Manager of Open and Instructional Resources. I just love that. Um, thank you, Quill. Um, it wasn't always Manager of Open and Instructional Resources, though. Um, but I will tell you about that. So hi, everyone. Um, up until about a year ago, I actually had a very different title. Um, and I will tell you that story. I was, um, I was the bookstore manager here at Nicolay College, and that's where I want to start. Um, that change agents can come from anywhere on your campus. Um, about two and a half years ago, I was tasked with looking, looking into OER um, from our newish college president. And I had no idea what OER was. Nobody on our campus had heard of it. So I started to investigate it and being a bookstore manager, I was like, you want me to do what? You want me to give away books? Okay, sure. I'll look into it. Um, we are part of the Wisconsin Technical College System, which is 16 technical colleges um, in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, we also are one of three um, of those schools that have a transfer agreement with the UW system, and we offer a liberal arts degree um, and a liberal uh, liberal science degree, associate degree. Um, so we have a lot of gen ed classes that transfer between here and the UW system. We have about 1,900, which is more students than I thought, uh, full and part-time students, and I work with about 100 uh, full and part-time faculty. Um, so that's where I'm coming from with all of this. So I started looking into OER and I started realizing that, yeah, I can get behind this. Um, being the bookstore manager, I saw what was happening with our students when they came in and I was telling them their textbook prices. Um, and I saw some of them break down in tears um, when they couldn't afford their books. So I started, um, I started off easy. I started off with um, those faculty who I knew weren't really using their books and I approached them. And those were the ones that I got on board first and it started off small. Um, and I went with a couple courses and we piloted those. 
and it kind of grew from there. Um, and as it started to grow, I realized that, wow, this is going to kind of take off here. So I really did start to learn. Um, I learned about OER and I learned about open education. And that's where I started to learn from others. Um, we're lucky that we are part of a community that is more than willing to share. Um, so I learned from obviously people that are a lot bigger than me. I was able to scale down um, to an institution my size. Um, but it was really, um, I really learned a lot in it. You, you need to, you need to learn to adapt to this new, this new world. And it really is a different, different world. Um, and of course, not everybody is willing to jump on board. And I was listening to everybody. Um, those who weren't agreeing with what we were starting, I, I listened. I listened. And I, I took into consideration what they were saying. And I really, I wanted to hear what they were saying and how could I, um, not how could I convince them to change, but how could I in the future um, going forward, how could I change what we were moving towards to maybe and help them change with it? Um, so I was really listening, listening to everybody, listening to those that were the early adopters, those were that were kind of moving slowly and those that were holding back. I was listening to everybody and taking all of those things into consideration. Um, and one thing I've been told recently by several faculty members um, were that, um, I speak with passion and that's what's helping convince them when I speak to our new faculty to when I speak with our administration when I speak with others and so I've really kind of been putting that into my advice lately is when you speak with it speak with passion um, you can't change things if you don't believe it yourself um, so really to speak with passion when you uh, want to make change and when you need to to change things, because if you don't, you're never gonna get anybody on board. Um, one of the things Quill brought up uh, was personal and professional um, investment and what you're willing to do to invest. Um, and if anybody read the article that she wrote up, um, I read it and it was talking about aligning with your own personal values and goals and things, and this really does with mine. Um, so I'm willing to personally and professionally invest in it and you have to look at yourself and what how it aligns with you and how much you're willing to personally and professionally invest and I think that bleeds through into this work and I think it does for most people at least that's what I've seen um, and that will that will flow through and that will help change things along the way. And sustaining the change, that's something I think we all need to work through. And I think that's a big topic in open education right now, is how do we sustain this in the long run? Um, and building that foundation, I think a lot, a lot of people just go into this as it's an initiative. And that's something that I've been not calling it, is I haven't been calling it an OER initiative. Um, I stopped calling that shortly after we started it. Um, this is the way we do things now. OER is embedded into the things that we do, whether it be the way we adopt our books now. Um, I automatically look for OERs, or when we start curriculum projects, um, it's automatically we bring OER into those conversations. Or everything OER is we are starting to just embed it in the way that we do things. And you start embedding open education into the way of the way of life into the culture. And when you start doing that, it just automatically is there. Um, sustaining it going forward, we still need to work on that. And a lot of people do. Um, and we're working that into our processes on how going forward, but it's a step in the right direction. Um, and again, I'm probably going to be looking forward to those who have gone before us, but we're making those steps um, towards those things. Um, but that's all I really have. We're a small institution, and I just want people to know that change agents can come from anywhere, um, whether it be bookstore managers, whether it be faculty, um, whether it be your librarians, and they rock. Um, they are helping to lead this um, movement, 
but it can come from anywhere. So thank you for this opportunity and I'll pass it on to, I believe, Mike. Thanks, Cindy. Um, good afternoon, everyone. How's, I hope everyone's doing well. Uh, I'm on the East Coast where it is very dreary and very cold. So those of you who are in warmer climates, I am quite envious. If we could go to the next slide, please. Okay, uh, Montgomery College is a rather large institution uh, right outside the District of Columbia. Uh, we have three campuses from our Tacoma Park campus, which is a very urban campus, up to our Germantown campus, which is more of a suburban campus. So the diversity is, is quite intense. We have about 60,000 uh, credit and non-credit students uh, from 160 different countries around the world. Uh, and that creates an, a number of exciting opportunities, uh, but also a number of challenges for our faculty and our staff. Um, we have about a 500 full-time faculty, almost 1,000 part-time faculty, and 600 support staff. Um, and that faculty, number large, large number of faculty, I think is important as we talk about OER and how we scaled up our OER efforts um, because it was an opportunity for us to really get a large number of sections on board pretty quickly. Um, we were uh, starting this work in OER maybe five or six years ago. Uh, I offered our first workshop on OER during a professional day uh, one fall and I had four people who showed up. Uh, and I think they showed up more out of pity than anything else. Uh, they didn't know what OER was. They didn't know what, what it meant. Uh, two of those were full-time people. Two were, were adjuncts. And only one of those continues to be involved in this work. Uh, where our work really began to bear fruit and take hold was when we had the opportunity and uh, was the recipient of one of the ATD OER initiative grants um, that really helped propel us and create a framework for us in which to fold a lot of this OER work that, that we were doing. Um, before the grant, we were capturing some of the, the results from our faculty, you know, but it was it was hit or miss. We we just heard through the grapevine that this faculty member was offering a course using OER, or this faculty was, but there was no systematic way to really focus on that. Uh, with the ATD grant, we had to have a designator into our course management system. And that allowed students to identify which courses were OER uh, or Z. When we, we focus on the Z part for the zero textbook cost because what we found was that we had a lot of faculty who were just not using textbooks, but were supplementing the, the content with their own PowerPoints or material from elsewhere. They just weren't charging or requiring students to pay a textbook cost. Um, and when we identified those courses, we had people coming out of the woodwork. I, I had faculty say, well, I've been doing this for 20 years. I just didn't have a way to let students know. Um, so as a result, this semester, we have about, 14, about 400 sections using OER or Z uh, with about 8,500 enrollments in those courses. Um, so it, it's been a, a wonderful opportunity for us, some, some great, uh, partnerships have developed around the country, uh, certainly partnerships within our own institution and the collaboration that has taken place within our institution uh, is, has been exciting. So there are four areas that I, I just wanna, wanna touch on uh, as you know, how I lead our change here at Montgomery College. And Cindy touched on it a little bit when she talked about, you know, she's gotten away from talking about it as an OER initiative and, and that it just becomes embedded as part of what you do um, and we too have gotten away from that we we don't focus as on this as a textbook initiative any longer we focus um, this on being an access 
issue or a social justice issue. So when we talk to students about it, we still talk about it in terms of how much they can save on textbooks. But when we talk to faculty and administrators about it, it's more about the social justice aspect and the student learning outcomes aspect, not just the textbook uh, savings. We have faculty who didn't know how much their textbooks were costing. So to tell them students were saving X amount of money, it didn't really resonate with them because they didn't know how much they were saving. Uh, so four, four areas that, that I wanna just touch on, this idea of indifference and the globalization of, of this indifference. Uh, what we try to let faculty know here is that by going to OER, they can make a difference in people's lives. I think too often we, we remove ourselves from the stories of the students. We look at the data, we look at numbers, but all of these students have a story behind what they do. Um, I had the opportunity a week or so ago to, to sit in on a student panel discussion uh, uh, focusing on world access to higher education day. Uh, and we had five students who were just talking about what access to higher education meant to them. And totally unscripted, um, each one of them said access to the Z courses that we offer propelled their education uh, because they just could not continue with the high text, uh, the high cost of textbooks that they they were experiencing. So, you know, working with faculty, trying to, to get them to understand that they can make a difference and it doesn't have to be, you know, at, at a institution-wide level. It, it can be at the classroom level. And as a result of that, it impacts the institution. And broader than that, it impacts the community. Um, so that, that's one area. The, the second area that we tend to talk to faculty about is to understand these generational differences. Um, not all students are digital natives. Uh, they don't like having just digital content. So we work with faculty to to make it easy for students if they want a hard copy or if they want to print something out. Um, you know, not everyone has a mobile device that they can just look at on the, the metro uh, or have access to Wi-Fi at home. So working with those faculty on understanding that there are people who have differences, generational differences, um, really has helped us. Um, the third area that I, I just want to touch on and we had a lot of faculty worry about this, is this fear of failure. Uh, they didn't want to try something new because it might not work. They, they were used to having a textbook. They've had a textbook ever since they've started teaching. And they didn't want to go to something new, something different. Um, and what we try to impress upon them is, yeah, certainly we're changing lives, but this is not life or death. If something doesn't work in a classroom, if an OER doesn't work, try something different. There's a bunch of material out there uh, that you can supplement and have students become agents of change and take ownership of that, their own learning and bring in material. So this, this concept of this fear of failure that some faculty had, we've worked hard to overcome that uh, and really work with them to say, okay, it's okay if it doesn't work, we'll move on to something else. And then the, the last point, Cindy did a, a very good job of, of touching on this, is that each one of us can just lead from where we are. Um, we don't have to be senior administrators. Uh, we can be at wherever we are in the institution and it makes a difference. Uh, a student doesn't care whether it's a faculty member, a bookstore manager, or a senior administrator leading this change. When they can take ownership of their own learning, save some money in the process, and increase their time to completion, it makes a difference to that student, but it doesn't necessarily make a difference to them as to who's leading that change. So I would encourage you, wherever you are in the institution, just pick up that mantle and, and run with it. You, you can make a difference. And that, that is about all I have. All right, Th thank you, uh, Mike. There was, a, there was a quick question. There's a lot of great comments going back and forth in the, in the chat window, but um, I think Annie Fox asked what learning management system you use. Oh, we're using Blackboard. Wonderful, all right, 
Quill, did you did you want to um, you had some concluding comments before we move on to our question and answer session? Um, <laughs> I'm trying to think of really smart ways to sum up the beautiful things that both Cindy and Michael said. Um, <laughs> and I think instead I'm going to let it, it just there are really some wonderful um, things said here and and I think I'm going to let them sit for a few minutes while we answer questions and then if people have questions about the um, the concept of change management then I think we can bring them back up again. How's that? Perfect. All right, Matthew, you're up next. Matthew Bloom uh, from Scottsdale Community College is going to lead the Q&A. Um, these are the questions you submitted. All right, right on. So yeah, everybody, so this is going to be a good opportunity for me to not talk a lot. What I want to do is try to make it so that everybody else is able to contribute as much as possible. Um, we want to hear from everyone in the community, anyone who has any feedback. Um, I do what we do understand that the first uh, few of these are actually not questions, but they are interesting topics for discussion and we would like to hear whatever feedback you might have on it. So um, just to get started, first of all, um, what are some thoughts that uh, anyone may have on a step by step process to move faculty to OER? What are some best practices for that? Some experiences maybe um, you've had for that. So anyone interested in in um, contributing, feel free to speak up. Okay, for my uh, Rock Street Community College, the first year we have like a grant or stipend of to kind of motivate a faculty member to write a proposal to use OER uh, program and it's kind of very successful because we uh, our I mean, president and vice president uh, sub I mean supporting uh, these, these this part that thing I want to share yeah I think having some sort of a stipend program or a, a grant program some kind of compensation for faculty uh, is always I think extremely helpful because a lot of times people are already stretched to the limit as it is and so um, just asking them to do something out of the kindness of their hearts is um, you know that's nice to do but not always the best any other thoughts uh, yeah this is Todd at Grayson College uh, something that helps me is uh, having been involved in social justice movements you don't generally look to convince everybody but you look for a critical mass of people that you can get passionate about and focus there that's a good good start it's one that we're doing here at Grayson College right now excellent yeah and I think that one of the experiences that I've had too is um, trying to cultivate the grassroots work that people are already doing and um, whether it's associated with the motivation that they have for a social justice issue or if it is um, and oftentimes it is but in other times maybe it's just simply um, you know they decided that they would like to customize their materials or whatever and then you can kind of cultivate those grassroots efforts individuals making changes in their classrooms um, and that can have a ripple effect uh, potentially to um, influence others as well yeah. yeah, it affected our strategy. Instead of trying to reach everybody, we're not trying. We're trying to reach a critical mass to start with. All right, very cool. Um, anyone else? All right, so uh, next question or next non-question slash topic. Um, so funding for sustaining OER, what are some models for actually sustaining this work? I can't tell you how many times in the last year, year and a half, I've heard the expression free like a puppy used to describe open educational resources. So um, how is it that, um, you know, that, what are your thoughts on sustaining these kinds of initiatives? Uh, th this is James. I'll chime in if uh, nobody else. Uh, oh, please go for it. Uh, so first of all, as, as a, as a, a, a too experienced middle manager, uh, I'll say there's always money. 
Uh, so you have to start there. Uh, where is the money being spent in an institution and, and how can you express your initiative, your project, your value in terms that the institution values or in terms that other initiatives understand and other initiatives can, can, can wrap themselves around. So for example, um, I, I know Richard, Richard and his project, they've been uh, starting to, to focus really on improving teaching and learning, right? So many of our institutions, uh, I think, have teaching and learning centers or they invest in faculty professional development when it helps them to become better teachers. So how does OER fit into that? Uh, another example might be here in, in California Community Colleges, there's a very large state initiative or funded state initiative around reducing equity gaps, uh, right? Reducing the achievement gaps between different demographics in, in our student body. So how can we fit OER into that? For, for those of us here on the call, that might be a no brainer, right? But, but how do we express to uh, funders, legislators, budget committees that uh, supporting OER will help to achieve this larger, uh, larger goal that everybody in the state needs to pursue. Yeah, excellent. I think that, and also some of the comments in here, I mean, it's, it has to do with attaching OER projects to the college mission. Um, I like to think of it as, and this is already mentioned as well, it's in everything we do. It's, uh, it's something that we can try to embed into the everyday um, activities. That way it's not like an additional thing that we have to be concerned with. Hi, Matthew. It's Mark. Like, uh, just real quick uh, to piggyback on what James was saying, uh, one of the things that, that we've looked at here is just making sure people understand it's an equity issue uh, and, and tying it back to the, the work we're doing at the college from that standpoint. Um, you know, it isn't necessarily putting course fees in place as, as some schools have done. We've, we've chosen not to do that, um, but looking at the retention in those courses, um, money that we don't have to return because students have not dropped, um, looking at comparing the, the number of courses that they take from one semester to the next, um, and you know, are they taking more courses or are they taking the, the same number of credit hours, but t saving that money or using that money for everyday living expenses, which provides an opportunity to continue their education. Excellent, thank you. Is there anyone else that has any suggestions for this or ideas? Okay, well, just for the sake of time, we'll move on to OER policies. I think that, um, you know, this is a pretty, potentially a broad topic, but what kinds of uh, OER policies do you have in your institution or in your initiative that you, that you feel are pretty vital? I think tenure and retention is a huge one at my institution um, because it eliminates some of the need for stipend money. But it, and it also means more through the life of the faculty member than a one time stipend. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, this is James again. I'll, I'll add at my institution, we do not have any policies around OER other than, let's say, our academic freedom policies, right, which, which apply. But uh, if our, our friends from uh, West Hills College Lemoore were here, I don't know if Kelsey's on, on or, or Ron, uh, they do have a board policy that uh, sets a goal, sets a target for a certain percentage, a high percentage of general education courses moving to OER by a, by a specific date. So there, there are examples out there uh, of really board level policy being set. Uh, and Kelsey's telling us 100% by the year 2020. So that, that's, wow. you know, it, I, I, it, it, that would not work in, in the culture of my institution. It just wouldn't work. But in many institutions, that might be exactly what you need is that high level direction. Yeah, and that, that type of policy would not work at our institution either. Uh, but having that, having the board or any board talk about OER 
and what it means to the institution, I think is, is invaluable. So, you know, if, if we as leaders at our institution can get that information to our board and have them reiterate it, uh, whether there's a policy or not, there, it does go a long way in helping sustain these efforts. Hi, this is Nathan at Houston Community College, and I just um, thought I would uh, chime in. We've got a, this is a policy that we've recently implemented, which is basically, um, it has, when, when um, our programs deter adopt textbooks, um, we are asking them to report what textbooks have been adopted. That's all textbooks. But we're also asking them to identify specifically OER that have been approved by the program for use uh, in a specific course. And it's, it's kind of slow going, but it's been really good because what that means is I can go to um, a central repository for those reports and I have a list of all of the programs that are using OER and what OER they're using. And then, um, and then I can contact faculty and I can work with them. So that's been actually pretty helpful. Sounds great. Anyone else? One thing that I have personally uh, found to be something that we need to probably work on is some sort of intellectual property policy or how, how it is that, um, you know, if we have faculty who are creating materials, you know, during their accountability to the college and the, the intellectual property policy actually means that the college owns the copyright, then um, we, we really feel like we need to be working with our, you know, legal counsel to figure out what that means in terms of, you know, the faculty right to put a Creative Commons license on it, or does the college really make that decision? Okay, so anyway, um, so moving on, uh, the next thing here is, um, it looks like a lot of discussions about the intellectual property policy. Um, so we're, we're pretty much up to, I know, listen to this, we could probably sit here all afternoon talking about these questions. Um, clearly, there's a lot of discussion to be had here, and I feel like we've done it, we've had good discussions so far. Um, so the question is, if anyone wants to stay for a few minutes, we'd be happy to uh, finish up with the Q&A, uh, because we are two minutes over past two o'clock right now. That sound good, Una? Uh, sounds perfect. Um I mean, I'm happy to stay for another five or 10 minutes, but it would be good to hear from people uh, um, if they need to take off. Sure, so we can do the official um, close of the meeting and then we will follow up with the questions afterwards. Uh, sounds good. I don't think we have anything after this. Um, oh, oh. Other, thank you, uh, Matthew, for reminding me. We do have an all members meeting. That's a more formal meeting. In some respects, well, we'll talk to you, uh, talk with you about um, the webinars that we have planned for the spring and some other activities. Um, so uh, look for an invitation to that. Um, but it will be on Wednesday, January 23rd at 3 p.m. Eastern. And I'm going to turn this back to Matthew. Excellent. Um, so uh, we have three of our seven questions there. And again, thank you everyone who was, uh, who's you know, participated in this event today and, and thanks for sticking around. Um, I'm, I'm definitely available for another 10, 15 minutes. There's a lot of interest on the, um, the chat, it looks like, about intellectual property policies. Um, so before we actually move on, I feel like it might be valuable to hear from someone else who maybe has uh, worked that out at their institution or maybe somebody who has anything to chime in about that. Any, 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 con um, any thoughts? Matthew, it's Mike. Uh, at our institution, our IP policy basically says that if you were paid to by the college and or used college uh, hardware or software to develop it, uh, it's owned by the the college, and thus the college can do what it wants with with that content or with that course. Uh, we've taken the approach over the years, however, that it's really a partnership. Uh, and while the college may have the legal authority to put a Creative Commons license on content, for example, we would not do that without the consent of the faculty member and working with the faculty member. 
uh, to make sure everyone's in agreement. Yes, very interesting. Yeah, and this is James again. I'll, I'll piggyback on, on that, my, what Michael shared. Uh, in, in my local institution, um, just because of our structure, I'm a dean. I've got, you know, my budgets in a sense and my staff in a sense. Uh, the really unwritten rule, but verbalized rule is if you get the support of my team or my budgets, then you use a CC by license. You know, we, we just avoid the conversation around, uh, you know, the IP policy in, our con in the collective bargaining agreement and so on and so forth. We just say, hey, you don't have to do this, but if you want to come over here in this part of the campus and play in this sandbox with us and get our support, then in exchange, it's going to be CC by. Right. Yeah, I think that that's one thing having the requirement. I mean, uh, the, the content that Maricopa Millions has developed over the years was, I mean, basically when you agree to receive the funding, then you're agreeing to, you know, uh, license any of the originally developed content um, attribution only. Well, and I think that's the interesting thing that there is in, uh, there are intellectual property policies surrounding the acceptance of funding or specific support to develop resources out of an office that does open education work because I have a similar agreement with faculty to the one James has but then there's kind of what happens to resources that were institutionally supported but that never get shared outside of our learning management systems because it's just not the faculty members just not interested in sharing that work even though technically it partially belongs to the institution. Our institution has a shared policy. Our policy is that we share intellectual property if it's supported by the institution. So how, and I think it's a really interesting question we're dealing with because I don't think our institutions really ever, my institution rarely exerts its intellectual property rights on faculty members work. And in fact, I haven't heard of it being done in a really long time where the institution has said, you know, we want to do something with work you created faculty member and let's have a conversation about what we're going to do to share the rights. Um, so I'm curious to know how many people actually have ever thought about enforcing the existing IP policies. Well, I'll tell you, I feel like uh, the culture, I think this is kind of was expressed already, but the, the, uh, in a different way, but the culture at our institution, I'm not sure that our faculty would be very, be very happy about that and compelling them to release content under, um, you know, in, uh, under a Creative Commons license, because that's what our administration decided they wanted to do in terms of enforcing, you know, their right over the, the materials, I think would be a really bad decision for OER and um, because of the, the way that it would, um, I mean, anytime administration comes down on faculty and says, you must do this, then there's always, um, you know, the potential backlash, you know, and so I feel like that would be probably not wise. All right, well, let's go to the next thing here. I think that's a good discussion, very important discussion, but let's go to the next one because we're not even halfway through the question. So best practices for including Z course or low cost designations in course registration system. So um, any thoughts about this here? If you have some kind of a course, uh, you know, designation, low cost designation, tell us what you're thinking about in terms of best practices. I just want to point out for people who are in a rush about this that Amy, before she had to go, posted a link to one of her really good blog posts on this that does a, an interesting review of decision making around um, labeling courses. Uh, Quill, can you put that in the chat window again because she shared a bunch of great links. Well, thank you for pointing that out. I, I can kind of say a little bit here. Maricopa has uh, implemented a low, uh, low cost and no cost designation. Um, and, you know, it's not an OER designation. It is just simply no cost, low cost. We use $40 as the threshold. Um, and we feel like that's been, it, it has been extremely helpful for us because it helped us to kind of, it helped to give us some kind of a, a number that we could use. We were able to determine how many sections, you know, are actually using that designation. But one problem that I've personally found is that it is, it has made it difficult to, um, 
it, it didn't help at all in communicating the distinction between free and free plus permissions with faculty and administration. So it, in a sense, um, I, I feel like, you know, one thing that we are going to try to do is try to fix that, you know, because we want to um, encourage people to be, become educated about open licensing versus just, you know, the free stuff that you can find or the cheap stuff that you can find. So that's one kind of contradiction. It's been extremely helpful on the one hand and very easy for people to understand, but it seems to have perpetuated some of the misconceptions about open licensing that we find. I think you're hitting on an interesting point there that our student, our scheduling system is used both as a marketing tool, but also as the data tool. Um, and I think that, that can be dangerous because students don't care if it's free plus permissions unless they're in a course where free plus, plus permissions means something because they're going to create something out of that resource. They care a lot more about free. <laughs> um, right. So we're trying to label our courses appropriately for the marketing part and for the communication to students part. But then if you're trying to make do any kind of data analysis of true OER, you get into some trouble um, in terms of now you've got things that are, you don't have clean data unless you have somehow two ways to get clean data. I know that's been an issue for us all along as we've talked about how to label our courses. Like we want the OER in one place and free in another place, but they're kind of the same thing. Yeah, and like you said, it's only if um, it's only in those situations, uh, you know, where we're trying to promote open pedagogy, where it's really important to understand the licensing, and as that increases in in you know popularity or it becomes more and more central to some of the work that we're doing, then it, I think that our our you know we've got to make that distinction more clearly. Um, but thank you for that. Um, so I have the sense here that we are now almost 15 minutes over and I think we will save the last three questions. I think that seems like a good idea. Um, we'll save those questions for a future event. Um, they're obviously really great questions and we look forward to it. Um, so thank you everybody for coming. Una, do you have any last words? No, thank you, Matthew, for facilitating that. And thanks to our, uh, our presenters and, and, of course, our entire executive council and to all of you who came today. Uh, great discussion. We'll continue some of this in January at our all members meeting. So take care and have a great uh, rest of your day and happy holidays. All right, happy holidays. Thanks, happy everyone. Holiday. Good night.